Well, hello again. Here we are at the sixth installment of the Structural Geology course. Here we're going to talk about joints in more detail, especially as regional characteristics that are indicative of certain geologic events. And eventually we're going to get to a little bit about veins. We'll start off talking about the morphology of orogenic forelands. So when you have an orogeny, when you have a compressional event that is going to involve mountain building, you have a lot of folding and a lot of regional deformation that takes place. And one of the characteristics of these regions is hydraulic fracturing. And if you recall, we talked before about how hydraulic fractures form and how they propagate. Notice here that the hydraulic fractures you would expect to see in these orogenic forelands have a special orientation. They're oriented parallel to our sigma 1 or perpendicular to our sigma 3, which if you remember makes them tensile or uh, extensional joints. They're often filled with vein material. We call these syntectonic natural hydraulic fractures. And the reason that we can establish that they are syntectonic is one, what we just said, they are oriented with a special relationship to the tectonic stresses. Our sigma 1 and our sigma 3 are the orientation of the tectonic stresses. And two, often the hydraulic fractures are filled with mineral fill that is characteristic of high pressures and temperatures. What that means is that, number one, it didn't form shallow, and number two, it was under that high pressure. And a high pressure, especially fluid pressure, is often achieved when these thrust sheet emplacements that are characteristic of orogenies uh, create an increase in overburden, an increase in pressure and depth that can fill up these hydraulic fractures, reduce the solubility of minerals, and create precipitate. So that's just a very specific characteristic of these forelands. And we're going to talk more about orogenic forelands because they're very significant in geo. Now, the next kind of jointing that we want to stress is jointing that is related to faulting. A lot of the jointing that you'll see is related to regional faulting. Remember, we're trying to talk about regional events here. Now, there's three specific kinds of this jointing that's closely related to faulting that takes place. See this first one, you can see the joints here are related specifically to the stresses that resulted in the faults in the first place. See our sigma 1 is coming down vertically and see how this fracture face is oriented at that expected 30 degrees to the sigma 1. And remember that we can expect to see that orientation along shear fractures because that is the way that they break in lab experiment, that's the way that the Griffith cracks that coalesce tend to uh, become weakest along. Now, notice that when our vertical stress is our sigma 1, this right here can be our tensile stress. And when your sigma 3 or your tensile stress is oriented this way, you can have extension along here and that will allow for these tensile joints to open up. And so those joints have a specific relationship to this fracture. And you can also have uh, joints that are due to the movement along faults. So they aren't due to the original stresses that caused the fault plane, but if you look here, they are due to tensile stresses that are created when there's movement along a fault. Now you can see from this fault, this is a thrust fault, and uh, we've got the hanging wall has moved up relative to the foot wall block. And you can see that when uh, tensile stresses are created, let's first say that um, opposite to this picture, that wall had moved down. You can imagine the extensional tensile stress that could result in joints like these right here. But let's take the picture as it's drawn and talk about it thrusting up. If this surface here, see how it's kind of rough, it's not totally planar, uh, causes frictional forces that cause this to warp a little as it moves up along it, there are tensile stresses created there. Tensile stresses that are along the lines of those um, extensional outer arc joints that we talked about in the last lesson. 
And thirdly, you can have joints that are adjacent to faults. Now, if you remember when we talked about how Griffith cracks may have a shear orientation of stress along them, but they cannot propagate along their own plane. And remember, we said the only thing that can propagate along its own plane in terms of ruptures is a joint, a tensile extensional joint. We'll take a look at this fracture. I see how it ends here and it ends here. Imagine that the stresses acting on it are shear. Well, we already know that fractures cannot propagate along their plane, so even though it's feeling shear stress, it's not going to move along this plane. So what's it going to do? Well, it results in these little joints here, and we call these pinnate joints, and they form adjacent to these uh, faults in reaction to that orientation of the tensile stresses that uh, are running along this fracture. And remember, we actually saw the very same thing on a micro scale with those Griffith cracks. Now, typically, the angle that these little pinnate structures form is going to be 30 to 45 degrees off the fracture. And the way that they form can indicate the sense of shear. As you can see here, the shear is this way on this side, which of course creates extensional tensile stresses here, and this way down here, which creates the extension of these joints. And so that can explain how those form. And then we want to talk about a regional phenomena. These are the outer arc extension joints that I had mentioned before. Um, when there is folding, especially again in orogenic forelands, we see these particular types of joints often. Now you can see here that you may have your hydraulic fractures that run along your signal. And then you see these little joints that will form in sort of a sunburst around the curvature here. And you can even imagine why just by looking at them. You remember how we talked about the membrane effect when rock is unloaded and uh, comes up and has to spread out as it moves away from the Earth's core and therefore it sort of thins and creates a tensile stress where jointing can happen? Well, this is a very similar effect. When you have this bending, here tensile stresses are created, here tensile stresses are created, and so you have these very specifically oriented types of joints. And that is something that you'll often see is going to start to form, see a little grid pattern here, because of the various stress fields that this region has undergone. And again, it's important to recognize these because a lot of the interesting geologic features that you're going to see involve folding, involve orogeny, involve all of these events that give you complex morphologies. And you'll see that these form along the fold axis of whatever the local sigma 1 has created as far as folds go. And so you still keep in mind the orientation that you expect certain kinds of joints to have to the stresses that are involved here. And um, the same kind of morphology can be seen in an event other than an orogeny. When you have regional warping that's due to flexural loading, you can see the same kind of thing. And that's basically, well, you've got differential loading, you have different things happening in different places, and a region, for whatever reason, undergoes a whole lot of folding and warping that creates these local tensile stresses and give you these very distinctive jointing patterns. Now, as we get into jointing patterns, we can move on and talk about orthogonal joint systems. And these joint systems are actually a little perplexing to geologists, and there's not consensus on how or why they form. You have two types of orthogonal joint systems. You've got this ladder pattern here, which has these long joints that run through it, and then it's crossed by short joints that terminate at the free surfaces of the other joints. And then you have an even more perplexing grid pattern, and this has cross-cutting relationships. Now ask yourself what that means. If they're cross-cutting, that implies a sort of synchronous formation or an alternating formation. Um, it couldn't have all formed at once. And uh, in fact, the explanations for both of these types of patterns are often elusive when you're trying to interpret what you're looking at in the field. Um, first of all, we have the phenomena that we just pointed out in the picture before when we were talking about Orogenic forelands, you have cross stripe joints, which means they cross the stripe of your, your uh, folding trend, 
that may be syntectonic hydraulic fractures. Remember, those are parallel to your sigma 1. And then you have strike parallel joints, which are going to be perpendicular to your sigma 1, which might reflect the outer arc extension joints or the release joints from when the orogenic, orogenic stresses were relaxed. This is going to give you a ladder pattern because you've got the formation of your long running through joints and then you have the formation of your short joints that say were created with the folding and are the release joints and they're not going to be able to cross over the basic free faces that are created by your long joints. So you're going to see a ladder pattern if that's what's taking place.